Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by our friends at YCharts. YCharts sent us a new report they put together called Which Leading Indicators Best Predict Market Declines? They looked at a bunch of stuff. The Buffett Indicator, Tobin's Q, PE ratios, CAPE ratios, uh, yield, sp yield spreads between the 10 and 2-year treasury, 10-year and 3-month treasury bill, year-over-year -year earnings growth, all of these. And then they figure out how many of the major declines of these things actually predicted. For most of them, it's 50% or less. Some of them, it's more like one-third of the time. And then when they look at the average time between these signals saying everything is a little out of whack versus the time the peak actually happens, a lot of times it's 6, 12, 24 months into the future. So it's kind of interesting. They, they look at the times that happened and kind of didn't. It's interesting because the, the one thing I come away with from this report is that there are no indicators you can use every time all the time that work for you. They're going to tell you something. And also probably speak for yourself. That's why that's why I use my own. I use my own. Probably though, every peak is different. So and the one the one that was interesting to me was that if you look at just like negative year over year earnings growth, it basically never works. It works less than it it works fewer times than it does work. So anyway, this is this is really interesting. I think it's just it's a good it's a good reminder of being humble for a lot of these things. So if you want to take a look at this, all I have to do is give me your or, email address. Or it's a good reminder that if you got, you got to work harder. Find a new. Got to find your own indicators. new indicator. Okay. All right. I think there's a thread about that somewhere from an influencer. How to make your own indicators. If you want to want to take this take a look at this, we'll have <laughs> we'll have a link in our show notes. Remember, Animal Spirits. Go to uh, Y Charts. Tell them Animal Spirits sent to you. You get twenty percent off that first subscription. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Look, I want to start off today talking about the student loan forgiveness thing because we got a ton of questions about this from people. Some people are really angry. Some people are just trying to figure out why people are so angry. I wrote a piece about this, but I wanted to do a little bullish bearish game here. Things I'm based on this, not, not saying this is good or bad, but based on this happening, first of all, I'm bullish household formation because I think that there are going to be some psychological benefits to this. The people who thought that you know they, they had this, this debt hanging over them now that they don't have it as much anymore in some cases that they could go out and buy a house. So I think if we have a median home price of like $850,000 in 2029, we could we could blame it on this. How's that sound? Fair? Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question or, or do you want to go through your list first? You can ask a question. You're the co-host here. <laughs> well, we're, we're, on, we're on your time right now, so okay. I want to be respectful. Go ahead. This $10,000... <laughs> This ten thousand dollars forgiveness. I think this matters. Does it wipe ten thousand dollars off the total bill, making each monthly payment smaller? Or if you have a th if you pay a thousand dollars a month, do you have ten months that are that that you're that you're good? I think it makes the bill smaller. That's a good. You're the first person that's asked this question, though. I haven't heard it seen it. Okay, if this Thank was you. if this was twenty twenty, but don't you think it matters? Don't you think it matters? Yeah, because I feel like I feel like if you have if you have ten thousand dollars of payments that are not, you know, deferred slash eliminated, that might change short-term spending behavior more so because if you've got, I'm making this up, $64,000 in, in student loan debt and that goes to $54,000, does that take your monthly payment down by 40 bucks a month? Does that really right. change it, your spending habits? Yeah, it's not changing much. The thing is, it's going to change people who have $20,000 or less probably. Those are the people who are probably going to have the biggest impact. It is, I mean, they said it's going to be mm. 43 million people that this is going to impact. It's a lot of people. Uh, I guess if this was 2020, you could say maybe Robin Hood would benefit, but it's 2022 and they probably won't. Uh, definitely old people who like to come, old rich people especially, who like to complain about young people. I'm bullish on that because old rich people love complaining about young people, right? Uh, I'm mm -hmm. bearish. I'm mm -hmm. bearish for people Tell who just paid, this time. I'm bearish for people who just paid off their loans. I'm bearish that colleges will actually reform anything from this, and I'm bearish that the government is still charging such high interest rates. I've talked about this before. I, I, I had like twenty to twenty five thousand in student loan debt coming out of college, which back in two thousand four when I graduated was pretty high, relative. But my interest rate was two and a half percent, and guess what? The ten year was way higher back then. So I, we keep getting emails from people saying my my interest rate is eight percent or seven percent. I just I don't understand why the government, since they hold the majority of these loans why they are charging, charging such high interest rate. My, my theory has always been just cancel all the interest on all these loans. That's the most fair compromise. But no one at the White House We need reform, right? We need some reform, some, some policy changes. Here's, here's uh, one thing. I'm happy for everyone that got their loan forgiven, and I understand why people are upset. I believe you me, I get it. 
but can we have some 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 real change? This, this doesn't this is, do anything. This is what my my whole piece was talking about some nuance here, and I understand why there are certain people that are very happy about this, and why there are certain people who are very angry about this. And like, if you were a person who just yeah, pay, who just sped up your whole thing and, and paid off all your loans, and then this happens, I would like I'd be pissed. I'd be I'd be mad. I can see why some people are mad. I can see why some people are happy. I don't think it's an all or nothing thing at, at, at all. Here's the one thing though. I think it's it's nice. Not that like I I totally can poke holes through this policy. He's, there's a lot of stuff wrong with it. The the one good thing I think, when in the last like twenty years have young people ever benefited from the government? There's a high cost of college. There's a high cost of daycare. High cost of housing. Young people have been screwed over for years and years. And old people are old, especially old rich people have been getting tax breaks for decades now. It's I think it's just kind of nice that guess what young people are finally getting their own handout. Because everyone else has got one. Fair. Right? Um, I don't know that. I, yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, Jason Furman tweeted, pouring roughly half a trillion dollars of gasoline on the inflationary fire that is already burning is reckless. Doing it while gl- uh, going well beyond one campaign promise and breaking another is even worse. Now, Jason Furman was the head of Obama's economic, is a council of economic advisors, something like that. So this is not a right-leaning person. Um, is this going to impact inflation? I, I mean, they've already had the moratorium on for since 2020, and they just extended that anyway. I don't, I don't know. It, again, the, the biggest thing I could see that would be like a psychological benefit. If someone was saying, I had these two loans. I mean, maybe, maybe, not, maybe, not, maybe not the best timing, right? I, I get that. I totally get that. But listen, this is, this is politics, right? No, no secret to anyone. We've got midterm elections coming up. Uh, and so, you know, it's what it is. Yeah, I, I, but I, w- is- I do wish I'm sure I'm sure many sensible people wish that this could actually lead to some policy reform. For example, how many how many uh, pieces of debt? I don't know why I said pieces of debt, uh, but how many I pieces, pieces of, of debt, debt like you for breakfast? Well done. All right. How many? <laughs> How many pieces of debt stay with you in bankruptcy? That, that, that's, what, that's one that makes this so bad. It's like just maybe even like making a slight change like that, just saying people can now declare bankruptcy and get rid of their student loans, right? See, so yeah, you're, you're a good audience today. You've been, you've been laughing pretty good today. So that was, it was a good time to pull a joke. I just, this is one of those topics where there are certain topics that I will pound the table on. For whatever reason, maybe it's my, where I'm at in life. If I was in my 20s, I might feel more strongly about this one way or another. But I feel like right now, I'm not willing to die on either hill for this, that this was a great thing or a terrible thing. I think it's got pros and cons. That's that's kind of my down-the-middle way to play this. Oh, Sorry. you're right down the middle. That's so, that's so shocking. <laughs> I know. Uh, no, listen, sometimes it's easy to, to say, well, one group is being more – but I, I, I agree with you. I genuinely understand people that think that this is uh, unfair if they just paid it off. Here's what I, here's, here's one thing that I will disagree with. I don't know that this encourages that this changes anybody's future behavior. I think there's a moral hazard. So now, so now what? Everyone's going to take out debt because there's going to be the hopes of forgiving it. I don't buy that. Um, but you could also say, why just college debt? What about credit card debt? What about targeting credit card debt for people for the lowest quintile income of Americans? Something like that. I don't the know. Funny, just, you know. The thing is. If if they canceled ten thousand dollars of everyone's credit card debt up to a certain income threshold, that would have that would be way more inflationary to me than student loan that's debt. A, <laughs> I was just saying, and that's a moral hazard. Maybe you do that one time. Yeah. Yes. Anyway. Uh, All right. So I, I've got a new I've got a new thing for Fed Day. So the Fed had their Jackson Hole meeting. Which why, why does the Fed have to meet in Jackson Hole? Like, is that just so they can? change out of their suits and wear cowboy hats and the the, the coats with like I'll the tell you, ruffles I'll tell you, that's exactly why. Josh, Josh, Josh told me this on TCAF, that it used to be held in, this is for the Kansas City Fed. It used to be held in Missouri. Uh, I forget who it was. Was it Volker? I can't remember. Somebody wanted to go fishing. And so they went up to uh, Montana. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So I, I was- Is out- Jackson Hole, Montana or is it Wyoming? That's Wyoming. Oh, is Jackson Hole, Wy- Wyoming? Wyoming. Okay, sorry. Same thing. Sorry. No. No. I, I mean, I, I know Wyoming very well. I mean, literally. My, Yellow, my I, know Yellowstone, box, but... I know Yellowstone is in Wyoming, Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Are you lagging again? No, I'm good. Oh, he's 100% lagging. <sighs> Damn it. Seriously? 
All right, let me know when I say now. How did I lag again? Dunk, let Duncan. me know when I say now. Now. It's like two seconds, Michael. Oh, shit's about to get crazy. Shit's okay. about to get crazy. Is, a two-second lag doesn't work when I'm trying to talk over you. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, I'll, I guess I'll wait my turn. Let's see if the audience likes it. <laughs> they will like it. All right. All right, so... I we need this to I decided to follow suit since they were going on vacation in Jackson Hole, and I took Friday off. The kids had school off, and we went to the lake all day. I didn't pay attention to the market. Stocks were down, I don't know, 3%, but I didn't care, so I, I caught up later. Here's, Jerome, here's something from Jerome Powell's speech. Restoring price stability will take some time and requires using our tools to forcefully bring, it, bring de demand and supply into better balance. Reducing inflation is likely to require a sustained period of below-trend growth. Moreover, there will very likely be some softening of labor market conditions. While higher interest rates, slower growth, and softer labor market conditions will bring down inflation, they will also bring some pain to households and businesses. These are the unfortunate costs of reducing inflation, but a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. He said pain twice in there. That can't be good. Here's the thing. I think that the Fed right now, talking tough, is like your friend at the bar who gets a little cocky after three Jack and Cokes, tries to start a fight with someone, and then immediately says, hold me back, hold me back. That's the Fed right now. They're the guy at the bar saying, hold me back. You want to know why? Because the stock market is still just in a correction, not a crash. The labor market is still resilient and very strong. And if you look at, look at this chart I put in here of Fed funds rates and inflation. Inflation is so far above Fed funds right now that I, I've got this data going back to 1950 or so. They have a ton of room to work with here. So they can talk tough all they want. Tell me what happens when the unemployment rate starts going up if they're still talking tough. That's when I really want to see, is the Fed serious about this or not? Because they can say all they want right now, but I feel like they're just saying, hold me back, hold me back. True. That is a point that is accurate. Michael Aroni, who we've spoken to from State Street, said uh, the biggest surprise here is that investors were bracing for Fed Chair Powell to talk tough on inflation, yet are reacting negatively after he did exactly that. Uh, it appears investors were naively hoping for a Powell pivot, but instead he doubled down on the Fed's inflation fighting credibility. Uh, yeah, stocks got, stocks got clocked on Friday. I, I still don't see you know, how you can... Spoke I don't see how you can take one day and think, all right, now I know exactly what the Fed's thinking or doing because of this one day. This gets back to my point I've been saying about the Game 7 thing. Everyone wants to read into every little gyration and move in the market. Sometimes this stuff just happens. It's, it's way more random than people think. Fair? Uh, mostly. Uh, things, are, things are so weird that we haven't even really spoken much about the yield curve, which is inverted all over the freaking place. Look at this chart of the two-year treasury rate, which is basically at, how many years ago is that? 15-year highs? I got to throw a yellow card for I mean, your what chart a weird, here. What a weird chart this is. Which one? I'm throwing a yellow card. Look, look at the lines on your chart. Which one? That, the, the lines that go to the numbers. You can't have those lines on there. Come on. <laughs> That's a rookie mistake. You can't, you can't have those lines. That, that just looks bad. It looks bad. You can't. That, it, come on. No, you know take why those, it looks bad? You know why it looks bad? No, no, no. It looks bad because by accident, I you're, that's an astute observation. I clicked black on those lines. Usually they're faint gray, so they stand out less. You're right. Good call. But look at this. The six-month treasury yields 3.2%, and the 10-year is 305. So normally, when the yield curve is inverted, and I don't know, people talk about maybe the three-month is, so the three-month is not inverted, the six-month, all right, whatever, be that as it may. You've got shorter-term rates above longer-term rates all over the place. And in ordinary times, and this is anything but, all we would focus on is the inverted yield curve. Remember? In 2019, when it inverted, we had uh, Cam Harvey come on the show. I mean, that, that was like headline news for a long time. We don't even talk about it. There's so much other stuff going on. I think that's the right. problem. So, so my, my, that, my that, local— well, that's, But that's, that, that's, my, that's my point. I know. My local credit union for years has offered 3% checking. And they've used that as a huge selling point for coming over to them. I feel like with the yield curve where it is right now, not a very good selling point anymore. I need 5% checking now. If the six-month T-bill is going to be at 3%, right? I feel like a lot of these places need to up their game. What, what's mm. our Marcus now? 1.7%? I don't know. I don't have money in Marcus anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm straight bonds now. New York municipal bonds. I, uh, ben, we got an email. And I put this in the doc before Friday, so I'm definitely not like padding 
ourselves in the back or anything. But somebody emailed us saying that, or, or maybe this is a comment on YouTube, actually. You guys sound bearish every episode. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe it's, maybe it's true. But uh, sorry for telling you how I feel. Uh, with the caveat, I'm not trying to scare anyone because I'm wrong all the time. More often than not, I'm not doing anything. I'm not saying that you should reduce your stock exposure because I think the, econ- the, the economy is uh, in a trickier place than it has been for the last decade. But how could you not be, how could you not sound a little bearish? I mean, the Fed, the Fed is trying to soften the economy and guess what? It's working. It'll, it's, what do you want me to say? The, the think, growth is slowing. Is it? Open your eyes. This is the first time I think I've ever been called bearish in my life. I'm I'm a I'm unapologetically bullish on the long term. Always, never bet against America, the U.S. economy, all that stuff. But I think it's okay to under to like mention when there's things that are bad going on. And inflation at nine percent is not a good thing, right? Yeah, the Fed trying and, and, to slow and, economic growth also not a good thing. Here's the thing. It's not as if stocks are in an uptrend and I'm saying, oh, just wait, right? Like, just wait. This is going to end badly. We don't talk that way. But the stock market is in a downtrend and the economy is slowing and the Fed is removing liquidity and the housing is slowing. The S&P 500 has been below the 200-day moving average for 99 days. It hasn't done that. It hasn't been in a downtrend like that since 2007. So the, 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 the market's bearish, not me. I'm not, you know, I'm not doing anything. Also, I don't know this, I said is, about that we're <laughs> this is a good thing, though, for a lot of people. <laughs> if you're saving money, this like it's OK to have bad news around smiling and it's OK to talk about it, too. Like you don't have to just close your eyes and pretend if you're just because you're a long term investor doesn't mean that you close your eyes and pretend nothing bad is ever going to happen or nothing bad is happening right now. It's OK to have both those thoughts in your head that I'm investing now for the long term and I think it's going to be things are going to be way better in the long term and they could get worse in the short term. That's OK to have those two those two competing ideas in your head. So Ben, I don't know. I don't know if this makes me like. Uh, I don't know if, if I feel more bearish or bullish about this data point, but corporate profit margins, and maybe company stocks are not the economy. Corporate profits are at all time highs still, and I suspect that they're going to be coming in a little bit because inflation is starting to eat into that. Does this make you? I guess. I guess you can make the bear case saying that. Uh, just wait until these come down. But I feel like the market is smarter than that. The market knows that margins have to come in. So, well, we see two data points here from Callan Thomas. He said uh, in, in Q2, U.S. corporate profits surpassed $2 trillion mark for the first time. And Lizanne Saunders said profit margins in the aggregate rose to 15.5% in the second quarter of 2022, strongest since the end of 1950. I don't know why they were so high in 1950, but here's the thing. This is why I think the stock market is probably, for the foreseeable future, and has been for a while now, just better than the economy. A lot of people will say the stock market has to kind of track the economy over the long term. I don't think that's true anymore. I think the stock market is better than the economy because corporations are better at pulling money out and profits out of people. Right? I was so going to say the corporation, is in better, the corporation is in better shape than the individual. Yes. So I, I think big corporations can do better than the economy because they have such high profit margins now. This is a great chart uh, from Bespoke. We've spoken about this many, many times, how – uh, bonds have not cushioned the blow for stocks to balanced uh, inv- investors with balanced portfolios. So they show a scatter plot showing the year-to-date total return on stocks and bonds. And of course, 2022 is a huge outlier. Never seen anything like this. Weird times in the economy, weird times in the market. So if you look at it, the, the ag bond ETF, that's just the iShares I US aggregate bond, which tracks the aggregate bond market, it's still down, even on a total return basis, eleven percent this year. It, I mean, well, because interest rates are coming back up. Interest rates came in a little bit for a second, and now they're now they come back up. It's it's just it is kind of crazy to see bonds down double digits in a, in a year. All right, so I talked about how the Fed has a margin of safety, and they're just saying hold me back and talking tough. And I think it's because the labor market is still so strong. The Wall Street Journal had this article, and they talked about two people who got laid off and basically got better paying jobs within a week or a day of getting laid off. So here's two anecdotes. Uh, within two and a half, th- this is about this, this person from Tampa, Florida. Within two and a half weeks, the Tampa, Florida resident had advanced to the final stage interviews. This is after they got laid off with seven companies and scored an offer from two of them. She accepted a remote copywriting job at Walgreens in late July with a salary 50% higher than her previous job. Now here's another guy. Around 1 p.m. the same day he got laid off, 
a recruiter for Baldwin Risk called Mr. Pearson with a job offer in sales management, told him it was the first time he had made an offer to someone the same day. This guy went from a salary of sixty grand to one hundred and fifteen grand the same day he got laid wow. off. These are anecdotes, obviously, but I think I think one thing we're seeing from a lot of people is remember back after two thousand eight, everyone was being told you're lucky to have a job right now. Why would you want to try to find a new job in this economy? What are you thinking? I think a lot of people are probably th- realizing now that maybe they're worth a little more than they thought, especially if they try to go to a new employer. And I think that the Fed still has this wind at their back. I, I don't know how much longer it's going to last, but this is why they're able to talk so tough on inflation because the labor market is is still just scalding hot. Yeah. And here's another thing making, making matters uh, weirder. We haven't really spoken about this. I think we spent a lot of time in 20, the back half of 2020, 2021, talking about the shift to work from home, the ramifications that this is one of the biggest like shocks to the labor market and all the ramifications of it, which are still uh, unfolding right now. Uh, Nick Bloom tweeted a chart, the percentage of paid full days of work from home. And he said, and this chart, you know, steady, steady, steady higher than the massive spike. In America alone, this is saving about 200 million hours and 6 billion miles of commuting a week. Think about how much happiness that gives to people that are not having to drive forever to their job or sit in traffic or sit on a train. I mean, how much, how much time are you saving on a train in a month? Probably 20 hours, 30 hours maybe? My happiness, has to, my happiness is definitely at an all-time high, not to brag. Here's the thing. So I, I, I agree that like the work from home stuff, it kind of got put on the back burner for a while because all this other stuff came to the forefront. But I think there's going to be ripple effects to this stuff for years, just in terms of like, think about the housing market versus commercial real estate and the values there and this commuting stuff and business travel, all these. Here's another one. So I've been remote for seven years now. And the thing about business travel now for us is when I come to see you, or we go to a different city to see each other it's mostly, there's a little bit of work involved, but it's mostly socializing time. And so I think more of those, those business trips are going to be about finding places to go socialize and introduce yourself or have more social time with your coworkers, right? Because the last two business trips I've taken, one was to Chicago and it was basically to go to a Cubs game with a bunch of our coworkers. The last time I came to New York a couple weeks ago, and we, we had a pool party and a cookout, right? So I think, I think you're going to have to be, have more planned social events in the future, for this kind of stuff, if you're especially for young people who want to get to know their coworkers better, and they're coming into a remote first employer, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, what other impacts are going to happen work from home? I like. I mean, we still haven't really, I don't think, seen the impact, or at least the long term impact to commercial real estate. I think you're going to see. A, I think you're going to see a massive mm-hmm. shift from. I feel like there's going to be a pivot point from commercial real estate values going into housing. I think housing is going to be the biggest beneficiary of this in certain areas where people have left and decided I don't need an office anymore. Um, ben, we, we've spoken many times about gasoline and uh, crude oil. And, uh, you know, how, how it, it, it seems as if gasoline jumps very quickly when crude oil goes up or when crude comes down. It's not the case. And we've spoken about how and why. But actually, look at this chart of uh, U.S. retail gas and uh, crude oil. Track's pretty good, no? It's not bad. You know, so last week I said it's kind of surprising. A lot of people probably be surprised to know that crude oil is flat on the year. It's gone nowhere since the start of the year. XLE, the energy ETF, is still up 52% this year, which is kind of wild if you think about it. Oil has gone nowhere, and energy stocks are up 50%. Do you think that has more to do with Obviously, they can they can make money doing other things like refining and all these other things, but they're not just selling gas, obviously. But do you think a lot of that is more positioning than anything, that more money has just gone into energy stocks this year? Uh, I can't tell you. I mean, I know the, the fundamentals of energy stocks are, I don't know if they're at all-time highs, but are looking <laughs> obviously significantly better than they have in the past. Wait, better as in their the ratios are up or better as in they're more attractive? Everything, free cash flow yield, like all of the fundamentals of the businesses are in okay. amazing places. Okay. From Bespoke, the prices paid component of all five regional Fed surveys declined in August, and all but one is at least at its lowest level since January 2021. So who knows, again, if this is a combination of supply chains healing, demand slowing, Fed, all of the above. Uh, lumber. 
Lumberg. Lumber at a 52-week low? Look at this. It's not bad. This is another thing that is ridiculously volatile. And I guess if you bought lumber at one of the highs and you, you built a new house, how badly do you have to feel? Like, let's say you bought lumber and locked in a 6% mortgage. Lumber at the highest 6% That's mortgage. Tough. That's tough, right? Give those people 10 grand. Give those people 10 grand. Yes. To offset their lumber costs. You get 10 grand. Uh, we spoke last week, Ben, about median prices of homes and median days of market. It appears as if the median days of market has bottomed. I think we said it was 14 or 17. I can't remember. Now it's up to 23 days. But the median price of a new single family home is uh, is coming down fairly, at least a year, well, at least a year over year changes. So maybe that's, that's not accurate. Oh, my neighbor. My neighbor lowered his price. Did they? How much? Not enough. Not six <laughs> six ninety nine. But I mean, talking about things coming down, this is just the year over year. This is like disinflation. This isn't. This is not like negative so far. This is just the growth rate is slowing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do. If if I was if if uh, if Zillow offered me the opportunity to bet on this person's house, I'm gonna say like. Uh, I think he's got. I think he's. I think he's got a hundred to go. I think this is like a six fifteener. Okay, so if they gave you an Maybe over, over under, you'd say under. I saw okay. Under, I put the over under at six fifteen. That's tough. I put it over on. Yeah. Uh, I saw the the thirty year uh, from Lance Lambert. The average thirty year fixed mortgage rate jumps to five point nine five percent. The range, the fifty two week range of these things is is ludicrous. It is kind of crazy that those can happen. In the, yeah, you sent this to me last week. It's kind of crazy that those could happen. So the thirty year fixed in the fifty two week range is a low of 2.9 and a high of 6.3. That I mean that is a massive amount of money in a house for your monthly payment. And Ben, you had you had you had your as far as I'm concerned this is the tweet of the your tweet of the year. This is from at a wealth of CS. Uh By the way, my guess is hey, Kevin Durant is when, locked when, when I started my Twitter handle, I was doing it just to share blog posts. I probably started this in 2013. No one told me you have to make a good Twitter handle. Okay? I didn't know it at the time. I can't yeah, change I, it now. It's too yeah, late. I, I, that, that's, no, on, that's on me. It's probably too late. No, you could change it. You could change what it. Would, what would it be? Like Ben Carlson no. for 2069? Like it, there, I couldn't find anything now. <laughs> no, you could change it. What? Do you think there's another Ben Carlson? Um, probably. My guess is Kevin Durant is locked into a 3% mortgage rate and simply doesn't want to buy a new house with a higher rate, so no trade. That was a good joke. Not bad, right? So Bill McBride had something about Very this. Very topical. Bill McBride has something about this. He says, divorce is usually one of the reasons people sell their homes, death, divorce, unemployment, et cetera. I spoke with a divorce attorney yesterday, and she told me couples are struggling with what to do with their homes because they have 3% mortgage rates and plenty of equity. They don't want to sell and pay taxes and then buy at 5.75% rates, and the spouse keeping the house doesn't want to refinance at these higher rates because you'd refinance to unlock some of the equity, I would imagine. They're looking at HELOCs to cash out, but that increase in mortgage rates makes it more complicated. So I think... The low, like, low mortgage rates, if they would have happened, totally kills the plot of the breakup. Remember what happened in the breakup with Jennifer Aniston and Vince Vaughn? They owned a condo together. Jason Bateman was their realtor. Do you remember this movie or not really? I, I really mm -hmm. like the breakup. Of course, of course, of course. And Love then the Chicago. Yeah, then they decide to sell and take the money out. If that happened today and they had a 3% mortgage locked in because they refinanced, there's no way they would sell that. They would figure out a way to make it work. So at the end of the breakup, spoiler alert, they don't make it together. They sell the house or they sell the condo and they go their separate ways, which was kind of a tough ending for some people. I thought it was okay. Well, at the very end, they paid. Yeah, that was, that was tough. That they didn't make it. But if it happened today and they had a 3% mortgage rate, they would find a way to make it work. Maybe Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Aniston would still be together so I, I, if mortgage rates were lower back then. <laughs> so here's a lead in the Wall Street Journal. Dave and Melissa Hostetler considered cutting the list price again on their Rockville, Maryland home in June. Instead, they decided to dangle another goodie before prospective buyers. Their low-rate mortgage could come with the house. Whoa. Mortgage assumption, as the practice is known, don't get too excited, uh, is garnering attention for the first time in years. It is typically allowed in government-backed mortgages like the Department of Veteran Affairs Programs. Um, the Hostetlers used when they bought their house in 2019. So this is an interesting little wrinkle, but apparently, like the article, like I just said, it looks like it's only available to a very small slice of the population. But, but could it, you imagine? If that, you, that's a game changer. But if you did that, what wouldn't you increase the value of your house by like a hundred grand to make up for the high mortgage rates now? Like you would say, you can have my three percent mortgage, but I'm going to need you, you to pay a premium oh, on that. Like that body. No, I'm you. You'd ask for a premium. But, but what if? Yeah, yeah of course. 
But but what if then you could then buy somebody else's mortgage? Uh, people send us all the time that apparently you can do this in like Canada and Great Britain. They have different the housing markets are or mortgage markets are different there. You can you can move a mortgage around, but you're I don't think you can lock in a rate for 30 years there. So you can do this, but not a bad idea. Who is this from? Uh, Len Kiefer. Uh, while institutional investors and iBuyers get a lot of press, they are a pretty small share of the overall market. This would surprise a lot of people. So it looks like institutional investors and iBuyers are responsible for less than 4% of purchases. It's tiny. It's still very tiny. And there was, news this, there was news this week that Blackstone is pausing their residential real estate efforts in, I think, 38 markets. I don't know if that's all the markets they're in, but... What about Vanguard? Are they still buying homes? Uh... <laughs> ben? No. Ben. Vanguard is not in the home buyer market. No more apologies from Michael. All right, let's get into our... We're still in the thick of our earnings season. NVIDIA reported... Oh, here's what I want to say. So I'm listening on the Quarter app to uh, a conference call this morning. An, an earnings call, I should say. And uh, the handyman was hanging uh, a ceiling fan in the guest room, Ben, where you stayed without a ceiling fan. And he walked in and he said, oh, you're finance guy. So we started talking. He's telling me, credit to him, that he's got a uh, million dollars in a, uh, in a multifamily uh, uh, unit, and he's got rental income, and his, his house is paid off. But he doesn't have money in the market because he's, you know, he's pretty risk averse. Uh, and he's asking me, you know, not for advice necessarily, but he's like, well, you know, what, 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 what can you, what sort of yields can I get these days? So I'm, we're talking, I'm, you know, I'm talking about the risk-free rate and, you know, that's sort of your baseline and you could get more yield if you're willing to take more risk. And you wait, you're giving the, you're giving the handyman the, the cap M uh, assumptions. No, no, no. I was giving him the risk-free rate. Okay. I mean, I'm not giving him any betas, but I'm giving him uh, the risk-free rate. So I said, listen, for a six month, uh, no, you can get three and a quarter. And then go from there. Um, but he, but he, he told me that uh, that he's that he's big into crypto, which was interesting considering that ten seconds earlier he had told me that he's pretty risk averse. But I, I kind of thought that it was just Bitcoin and Ethereum. But he, he went down the list. He goes, I, I got Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, Cardano. Those things aren't going anywhere. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah, I'm I'm pretty I'm you know I'm bullish long term, but. You know, these things can get that, cut in half again. Well, that's Who interesting knows? that someone sentiment would be... Is toilet, sentiment is in the toilet right now. But someone would be really into crypto, but not the stock market. That's that's surprising. If you could handle crypto volatility, you can totally handle the stock market. Yeah. Um, well, he's not... He, he made it clear that he's not too fond of the current administration. Said that things went to hell. Uh, so... He's not very, you know, not comfortable in the stock. As market. always, just use your um, politics. There's no use your politics to invest. That that works every time. So there's no precedent of uh, crypto. Anyhow, um, I just thought that that was. Uh, I don't know what I thought it was, but nice guy, very nice guy. You actually. keep how many handymen um, do you keep on the, on your staff? Because you have handymen working all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Plumbers, handymen. No. You <laughs> you got a whole staff. I mean, over you, there. You, what? You don't have a plumber? You don't have a handyman? I, do you not have a plumber, sir? What do I need a plumber for? Your house when shit breaks. Uh, I, luckily, we we built a new house five years ago. Nothing's broken yet. Nothing bad yet, at least. All right, you're in trouble. All right, you should uh, you, you should find years. a plumber before it's too late. Um. All right, and so Nvidia. Um. Nvidia, the stock was down nine percent, I think, on the day. The stock looks like shit. It's fifty two percent off its highs, which is basically about the biggest drawdown of the last decade. Quote, uh, right from the open, this was a challenging quarter. Total revenue of $6.7 billion was down 19% sequentially and up 3% year over year, below the $8.1 billion outlook we provided on our last earnings call. That's really bad, for the record. Gaming revenue of $2.04 billion was down 44% sequentially. All right, people are getting outside. And down 33% year on year, reflecting challenging market conditions. Okay, everything, fair enough. But, here, but here's the thing, Ben. As discussed in May, we expected a sequential decline in gaming revenue due to softness in Europe related to the war in Ukraine and COVID lockdowns in China. Um, if you're going to blame the specific macro on your challenges, I need, I need, I need, I need regional breakdowns. Tell me, you know what I mean? Like if you're going to blame the war, then say 
you know, 47% of our business is in, uh, is in uh, Eastern Europe. Man, have you looked at the drawdown chart for NVIDIA? So this, this is a stock that goes back to 1999. It's at three- Sir, sir, do you, are, are, you listening, are you listening to the podcast? What? I just said that. Well, you said it's 50%, 50 right? I said this is, this is as bad as a drawdown as it's had over the last 10 years. It had another one. Yeah, I'm, I'm going back. Go on. I'm sorry, I'm going back 20 years. I'm trumping you here. It goes, <laughs> we got a 70, we had 80% drawdown in the tech bubble, a 90% drawdown, oh no, sorry, 90% drawdown in the tech bubble, uh, 80% in 2008, yeah. 56% wow. in COVID, and now 52% now. This thing is, this is a volatile stock to say the least. Uh, but gains have been massive. Yes. At least. So that, that's the trade off. Um, you know what? I'm going to throw this in the dock just so the viewers can take a, can take a gander. This is yes. Um, all right. We had dollar stores report last week. Dollar tree bought family dollar. Remember that? Hey, Remember family dollar. So, so I was at a family wedding this weekend and my dad mentioned for the first time in his life, he went into a dollar store and was like blown away. He'd never been to a dollar store before. First time. Yes, which is surprising because my my Do father Dallas? my father is a very frugal man and he has never been he went, and he said that he went there because he needed a pair of shorts for the hot tub in his hotel room, his hotel pool and picked up two pairs of shorts and I'm like, "Dad, why did you go to the dollar store to get shorts?" He picked up one pair that was a double XL <laughs> and one That's bold. And one pair that was a small and he said he held them up together. And the double XL and the small were the same exact size. <laughs> so, so that's what you get for dollar twenty-five. So, okay, so Dollar Tree is actually a dollar twenty-five. They mentioned inflation fourteen times on the call. They lowered guidance. The stock kept the stock had been doing uh, actually very well, but it fell fifteen percent in, in the two days following the call. Here's a quote: Inflation is at its highest in decades as shoppers are experiencing higher costs related to food, fuel, rent, and more. Supply chains have been strained and inconsistent. Inventory levels are higher across retail, and consumer shopping patterns continue to zig and zag. Right? Do they not? They do. Just like just like inventories at retailers. Uh, they said dis discretionary comps fell four percent as shoppers continue to manage this inflationary environment. Although I gotta wonder, at a dollar store, I guess I guess you are seeing uh, changing spending habits at dollar stores, even though everything is a dollar twenty five. Um, they got a 3.3% increase in average ticket, meaning people are buying more, which more than offsets a 1.2% decline in transaction count. So less transactions, I am surprised that you're buckets. not seeing more people go to dollar what, stores with inflation being this high. Well, actually they were. Dollar General did quite well. We'll get to that in a second. But here's, here's the, so we spoke about like margins have to, there's only so much cost that you could pass on to, to customers. So here's another quote from the call. Our suppliers are being hit with uh, inflation as well. This, along with our commitments to competitive pricing and the value proposition, is expected to negatively impact our gross margins in the near term. So they got it down. But th listen to this little nugget, Ben. Dollar Tree sales continue to be negative. It really is a global supply chain. Dollar Tree sales continue to be negatively affected by the global helium shortage. This directly affects balloon sales. How about that? Okay. That's a random one. Okay. So Dollar General, again, same, same store, basically. Uh, it's bigger, though. Um, they mentioned inflation 16 times. And, and listening to this, this got the, the Dollar General is way more upbeat. So wait, well, how are you getting they the mention? We so this is, to you're using the quarter thing where you can search by word? Is that are you are getting these numbers? I search, by, I search by word. Okay. Search by word. Which you can do now. No big deal. All right. Um, Dollar General, they say we remain committed to offering products at the $1 or less price point. Does that mean that all of their products are still $1? I don't know. You listen to the call, not me. <laughs> you said you go to, you, use, you go to dollar stores. Yeah, it's, it's dollar twenty five where I go. I, I think ours is a dollar tree. Sorry. I, Which I, one do you go to? Dollar tree. No, I'm not a dollar general guy. You must go to the tray. Yeah. You must go to the tray. Um, but they sound way more upbeat. Uh, yeah, here's what they said. The quarter was highlighted by comp sales growth of 4.6%, a slight increase in customer traffic. So, Ben, to your point, more people going to the dollar store. Accelerated growth in market share of highly consumable product sales, including in both dollars and units, and double-digit growth in diluted EPS. Uh, duh, 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 duh. Um, 
they said that uh, as a result of our first half out performance and strong start to Q3, as well as our expectations for the remainder of the year, we are increasing our sales outlook for fiscal 22. So, uh, you know, Dollar General is executing, Dollar Tree is not for whatever reason. But listen to this, Dollar General, they have more than 18,500 stores that are located within five miles of 75% of the U.S. population. Jeez. They're everywhere. It's not bad. They're everywhere. All right, moving on. Uh, Toll Brothers. The stock reacted negatively to earnings, which you'll find out why in a second. The stock is uh, 38% off its highs. Here we go, Ben. We reported earnings of 235 per share, up 26% compared to the third quarter of 2021, and driven by continued gross margin expansion, uh, which was an improvement um, compared to last year and better than guidance. Uh, the, the, however, here, sorry, this is, this is why they fell. Although we received, uh, although we achieved record third quarter revenues, net income and EPS and our revenues were lower than anticipated due to fewer deliveries than projected, the shortfall resulted from combined impact of unforeseen delays with municipal inspections, continued labor shortages, ongoing supply chain disruptions and a soft, softer demand environment. We missed our delivery guidance by 336 homes. Due to these challenges, we are lowering our guidance, our deliveries guidance, uh, for the full year. They said, uh, as our third quarter progressed, we saw a significant decline in demand as many prospective buyers stepped to the sideline in the face of steep increase in mortgage rates, significantly higher home prices, a volatile stock market, and rising inflation. Buyer confidence was also impacted by the nonstop headlines about a softening housing market and by a general sense of uncertainty regarding the future direction of the economy. All these factor factors led to a market change in psychology, and buyers remain cautious through the summer month. Well, that's the tough For part about third this. Quarter, we purposely did from a real estate standpoint is that these home builders are never going to want to build a bunch of homes again. Every time they do, they get a slap on the wrist and they're like, "Screw it, fine. We'll just we'll just build high-end homes for people and the inventory of houses is just never going to increase again." I feel like that these ho these homeowner these home builders just Ooh. it's so cyclical, right? That like we're just unless the government really does something that makes it worthwhile for them to to build a bunch of homes, it's never going to happen. So they said that buyers were on the sidelines, which is something that we spoke about last week, about there just being a huge uh, bid-ass spread because sellers are anchored to the highs naturally. But I think this is the, the, the long-term point I think is important. They said, because we've talked about how like, yeah, home prices are going to come down, but there's probably a higher floor, at least my opinion, than most people think because there's still so much demand. They said, despite the near-term uncertainty, we believe that many fundamental drivers that have supported the housing market in recent years remain firmly in place. These include favorable demographics with more and more millennials reaching their prime home buying years and baby boomers relocating as they embrace new lifestyles. The undersupply of new homes over the past decade, which has led to a large deficit and tight supply of homes for sale. Migration trends dr uh, driven by more workplace flexibility and the greater appreciation for their home for homes that Americans have embraced in the past few years. We believe those, these long-term secular trends will continue to support demand for home ownership well into the future. Do you agree? Yes, but only for a certain subset of the population. I feel like the whole, I feel like the inequality in the real estate market is just going to continue getting wider and wider and wider. And th there, there's going to be no more starter homes being built and it's going to be more high-end homes. It's going to be homes over four or $500,000 for people who can afford it. And there's not going to be enough homes made to get the appetite of people who want to buy homes and they're going to be priced out. Um, did you see, uh, a mint condition Mickey, ben Mickey Mantle baseball card sold for $12.6 I didn't see that. You see, like, most of the froth coming out of the market, a lot of, like, these speculate, like, the collection things. But this was the most ever spent for sports memorabilia by, like, a lot. Uh, the, the, the record prior to this was a $9.3 million jersey worn by Diego Maradona. Uh, I don't know who that is. He's, I guess he's a soccer player. Yeah. Hand of, he, uh, he scored the contentious hand of God goal in soccer's 1986 world cup. Ben, you know about that hand of God goal? I don't know about that. Sure. Here's the interesting thing about this list. So they list the top <laughs> 10. I know I've heard of Maradona before. Uh, so like the top ones are Mickey Mantle, Honus Wagner, but then you're all these new ones on here. So there's LeBron James and Luka Doncic and Patrick Mahomes and Mike Trout. It's interesting that some of the newer cards are actually getting on here so quickly. You'd think a lot of it is just old cards and there aren't enough of them so people pay up for them. 
No, but, but you know, newer. But I bet you it's the opposite. It's the opposite. The the new card manufacturers, maybe they same as the old, but they learn the mistakes of the old ones, not oversupplying the market, right? Because of this Patrick Mahomes one and the LeBron ones, they're probably like, they're probably super super rare. Uh, if you don't follow Sam Rose uh, Substack, you should be. He did a post over the weekend talking about income household spe- uh, higher income household spending is changing. So he's got this chart from Bank of America. And it breaks down uh, spending, total credit card spending over May, June, and July based on where people fall in the income spectrum. And the highest income group, which is people that make over $125,000, their, their credit card spending was down in May, June, and July. Your thoughts? Uh, I guess it had to happen at some point. I don't know. Here, here's, a, here's a forecast for you. Uh, you are going to be spending more at Disney when you go. Okay, that, that's my, your, your spending what? is good, then you think. All right, did you see this story in the Wall Street Journal this week? About yield management at Disney? This is a new one, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, go okay. ahead. Uh, even as the company limits its visitors and keeps attendance at its U.S. theme parks below pre-pandemic levels, they are generating record sales and profits. The results reflect a major strategic shift in Disney's part where the company is focused less on maximizing the quantity of visitors and more on increasing how much money each visitor spends and approach the company refers to as yield management improving the visitor experience. They just want people to spend more time there, so they want to create better rides, charge more for them, and have people spend more money. So the biggest change in the past two years, the most lucrative for Disney, is the introduction of a smartphone app feature called Genie Plus that costs $15 a person per day, on top of the price of admission. But Genie Plus doesn't cover everything. To skip the standby lines that most sought after uh, attractions, including some Star Wars and Guardians of the Galaxy's theme rides, reservations now cost an additional $10 to $17 per person. It seems like most of these places are realizing let's just make it good for the people with a lot of money and they'll spend. We know once they get there, they're going to spend money. So I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to tell you whatever you think you're going to spend in Disney at 20%. 20. (laughs) twenty. I don't don't know. It's going to, it's going to be a lot. I'm just telling you. Yes. 20% at least. Sorry. Your, your 10 grand just went to Um, 12, but it looks like, it looks like airline spending peaked in March 2022. Even though people are still traveling, that was the peak of it. But you know what's interesting? Look at the charts of uh, the, this airline ETF, Jets. This looks like crap. This is the definition of, uh, Ben, what do we call this? The worst industry ever? Lower the highs. The worst industry ever to invest in, I guess? Lower highs. Okay. What are, what are the odds? So you and I are both going to California in a couple weeks. What are the odds one of us either loses a bag or has a flight delay? It's got to be pretty high. Uh, oof. We're leaving early, so hopefully, hopefully not me. Right. But the, the the airline stocks almost almost got back all of their losses for a minute in early twenty one, and they're not quite near the March twenty twenty lows, but they're not okay. that See, far away. Warren, eh, Warren Buffett was, but this looks Warren like Buffett was right. He's proven right. You just had to wait a little longer. Nailed it. Um. All right, Ben. There has never been a bigger a bigger chasm between what the audience, how the audience feels about movies and how critics feel. Lucas Shaw did an article for Bloomberg, um, and he said, audiences have given the top 10 movies an average score more than 19 points higher than critics. By far the biggest difference this century. The only two of the year's top 10 biggest movies where the audience and critics are even close are Top Gun and The Batman. So look at this next chart. How, how interesting is this? What do you think is going on here? Are critics just critics are just one of the theories? Critics are just done with Marvel. They're over it. That's probably. It. And if you're a Marvel fan, you rate all the Marvel movies high. And if you're someone who actually rates movies, I mean, who are the people that actually go on IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes in the first place? Who who are these people? Because Not have me. you ever gotten done with the movie and gone, ah, oh, I'm gonna go give it a rating on my favorite rating website? Sorry, I say to my wife that was good or that was worse than expected. Uh, That's about it. Who would they put? You're right, Ben. Because look at this. Also, Jurassic World Dominion. Worse than expected. I'm blaming you for this. What? The, eyes wide. Which eyes one? wide shut. What the? Uh, uh, no payoff there. You didn't like it? Just z- it was. You didn't like it? Listen, I love Tom Cruise. That was probably the worst Tom Cruise movie I've ever seen. No, you're no, you're wrong. That, no, come on. It. First of all, the Mummy was way worse. Okay, fair, but. Eyes Wide, Eyes Wide Shut is a great Eyes Wide Shut is a great it movie. It was the first half of it was good because it's like you're seeing build up, build up. Okay, something's gonna happen, and then all of a sudden it just sort of ended. No, 
All right. Agree to disagree. Fair. I I liked it. Whoever, I don't understand how Jurassic World Dominion got a 70-something. It's the worst movie ever. It was pretty bad. Um, but you know what I love? I love how when you order something on the internet, you could just do this express checkout. You could connect your PayPal, your Amazon, your whatever. But this caught my eye. MetaPay? Facebook is getting in on the game? They probably did a while ago. And we just missed it. I think this is something we probably just missed. I didn't know so I. I I realized, so I, I bought, I, I got new socks this week. When's the last time you bought new socks? Are you, are you a new sock guy or do you tend to hold on to your socks? I get new running socks. Like for, I have it on Amazon, subscribe and say once every six months. And the feeling of putting on new socks is, is pretty hard okay. to explain. It's, 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 it's lovely. It, it's euphoric. Yeah. I think I, I think I've gone two years, which is probably a year too long. So if you've, you know, if, if you've been on the fence about getting new socks, I, I suggest you get them. Um, all right, let's great, move great on. Great recommendation. To... <laughs> Buy new socks. Well, because it's probably not something that's, that's front and center. It's probably not something you think about too often, but I'm, I'm just here to remind you. That's why you. I put it on subscribe if, and if, save. If, if, you're not, if you're like, you know what? It's, it's been a while. It's been a while since I got new socks. Get new socks. All right. um, and if you haven't, buy right. some new underwear. House of the Dragon is. <laughs> <laughs> House of the Dragon was already renewed. Probably not surprising, but 20 million people watched the first episode. Yeah, uh, su- surprising a little because the last season of Game of Thrones was a lot of people didn't like it. So I, it's interesting that this many people are are on board for. And I, I didn't mind the last. I just want to. I just want to reiterate. I know we spoke about we spoke about uh, Sean's freezing cold take last week. He said he preferred Black most of the Departed, which I didn't even get into. Like De- Johnny Depp's performance, that was I don't know if it's horrible or just weird, but they made him look unattractive, which it just none of it worked. Uh, the movie was fine. It's a fine movie, but we uh, Duncan did a poll or Nicole or somebody did a poll on here. Which movie did you like more, The Departed Black Mass? Ninety two percent said The Departed, and the other eight percent. I don't know what's wrong with them, but it, you know, pretty 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 clear cut there. All right, Ben, I wanted to hit you with something. On Thursday, I uh, I went to see a movie, and I saw The Beast. With Idris Elba. Are you familiar with this movie? <laughs> I'm never familiar with any movies that you recommend. The last four weeks has been movies I've <laughs> never heard of. So, no, I've never heard of this movie. How was it? So, it was phenomenal. So, Idris Elba takes his two daughters uh, to Africa, and they're hunted by lions. The best review, I saw a Rotten Tomatoes uh, review. It's like Jaws on the Sahara. So I was thinking about I'm sure this. that's exactly how huge, it was pitched, too. I'm a huge man versus nature, or nature attacks man guy, okay? I love when the animals fight back. So with that in mind, I've got my top 10 animal versus okay, man. Okay, real quick. Movies. This has got a 5.9 on, I, do you like this? 5.9 on IMDb, just so you know. That's pretty low for my taste, but... Is that good? N- not good. I don't watch anything below a 6 at 5, probably. But keep going. You elitist. You don't go below 6'5"? Unless it's a comedy. I don't go above 6'5". I, I, of course you don't. All right. Give me your okay. top 10. Wait, but, but do you like, do you like uh, animal movies? Sure. Do you want to you guess the... This, <laughs> this, this is the best box office one that you've had in a while. Brought in $21 million at the box office. That's pretty good. Yeah. All right. Give me... That's actually pretty give good. Give me your top 10. And, all right, here we go. Here's my list. Here's here's my list. Jaws. And it, this isn't going to work because you're in a delay. The the audience doesn't even know that we're struggling with it. We're fighting through Just a delay. Just give me your here. whole top ten and then I'll comment. We got Jaws. I'm good. All right. Jaws, Anaconda, which I, I mean, I love that as a child. Uh, the Revenant, The Grey, Crawl. Actually, time out. These <laughs> movies get like a 30... F- at least maybe, I'm maybe sorry. 40% premium this is the, seeing them in the this, theater. This list is already if terrible. These, if you see these movies, the, the gray, <laughs> if you that see movie these movies was at awful. home, which doesn't, doesn't have the same power. Right. The, okay. Cause you saw it on your couch. That's what I'm saying. I saw the gray in the theater and it was terrible. This sounds like an ironic. This sounds like I'm saying you can't see this. This is like an unintentional comedy list besides Jaws, but go ahead. Anaconda. No irony. There's no with, irony with here. Jennifer Lopez right, me, and Ice Cube. Let me, let me. Do you remember the ending of that movie? Let me continue. And John and, and and John Void. Of course, I remember that movie very well. Uh, okay, Crawl. Maybe one of your worst recommendations on this show, in the show's history is Crawl. <laughs> Lake Placid. Actually, not bad. 
Oliver Platt. Tell me you didn't like Lake Placid. Betty White. Wasn't it Betty White's pet or something? Thank you. Uh, Open water. Open. (laughs) That's right. Open water was a shark movie. Very good. The Edge with Alec Baldwin and and Anthony Hopkins. Did you like that one? Yeah, that was okay. Or is that like a six a six point two? Is that is? Um. Okay. How about this one? This is not good, but I enjoyed it. I saw it in the theater. The Ghost in the Darkness. Val Kilmer, Michael Douglas. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was okay. All right. Uh, and then uh, I, I don't know if I'm stretching because these are not animals. They're, they're more monsters. But the Meg, obviously, is an honorable mention. <laughs> Another great recommendation of yours. And, and finally, this is a joke. Snakes on a plane. Okay. I actually never saw that movie. I do remember that. That was like one of the first unintentionally unintentional comedy movies ever made, I think, though. Okay. I, I think this, this is just honestly yes. thinking about this more. Could you say Jurassic Park? Animals, kind of? Well, that literally, I left that off. Because, right. you know. All right, we got to talk about the rehearsal. Have you been watching this show? I finished it. Okay. I, four episodes in, here's my problem with this show. I get it, like, this guy is kind of a genius. He went out of his way to, like, make this happen, and he obviously has, like, a very unique mind. I just, as someone who grew up on reality television, like, I watched the very first season of The Real World. Like, the first four seasons of The Real World were actually, like, kind of real people, even though it was a weird situation. I don't believe anything that happens on reality television anymore. And obviously, this guy went out of his way to show that a lot of this stuff was, like, pre-planned or just none of this felt real to me at all. It felt like the whole thing was just acted and planned out. And so I just kind of didn't get it. Like, I got it, but I, I just... Did you think Angela was an actor? Yes. Did you think Angela, did you think Angela was an actor? It seemed like... I, I feel like anyone who goes on reality television has ulterior motives. It's kind of like, like, to me, like, if you wanted to be a politician today, that, like, excludes you from me wanting to vote for you because there's something wrong with you. And if you want to go on reality television today, it's the same thing. How about this? Yeah, I don't know that I, that I enjoyed it. I, I watched it pretty quickly, so I was just like, what the hell is I, this? I was uh, interested I'm in not it. watching season two. I was interested in it, but yeah, I... It, yeah, I'm, I'm, I just I like I know a lot of people like shocked by what happened, but I can't be shocked by th- something that I think is probably like 97 percent fake. That's kind of how I felt about it. I don't. I just uh, I'm maybe may I'm, I'm too cynical, but I understand why. Like he deserves props for doing something. Like I think the best thing he did was recreate that bar in a warehouse. That 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 was probably the best thing that he did. Like the most interesting thing he did. I can't believe you hated Eyes Wide Shut. I didn't hate it. I just I. I was confused by it. It didn't, it just, it was a very bizarre movie. I don't know. You don't get Kubrick. All right. One more. I got one more here. Uh, someone, I, I think on our, on our discord channel, someone gave me, I asked for some f- fiction recommendations. I needed something different. I, I needed a change every once in a while for my detective novels. And someone gave me this book called the other passenger, Pr- probably not a Michael Batten. It could probably, it feels like it could have been a movie, but it's, it's about an older Gen X couple with no kids who befriends a younger millennial couple and it's in, it takes place in London and the whole it's affairs and drinking and drugs. And there's like three twists in it. Like someone's missing it's, and you've got to kind of, it's very mysterious and it's pretty good in that way in the sense that you're kind of always on your toes. But the main premise of the book in the plot is the younger couple is really angry at the older couple and all most older people because housing in London is so unaffordable that they will never be able to buy a house there. And it's like this, this like, generational resentment that you could have bought a house in the past and now buying a house alone made you wealthy. And I feel like that's kind of where we're heading in this country. Because if you look at real estate in the UK, it's way, way worse compared to disposable income, any of those metrics than it is here. It kind of feels like we're heading there where where future generations are going to look back at, at people call it 40 and above now and say, if you bought a house, you jerks, you got a great deal and we're screwed. I kind of feel like that's, that's well, where we're at. My heading. handyman, for example. Which one? Who is a blue collar guy and I'm sure he, <laughs> but he has, he has a home paid off and an investment property paid off. Right. All credit to him, but it's, it's hard to imagine a young person, even, you know, fast forward 20 years from now being in a similar situation. Yes. That, and I think that but I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't know. I think young people, that's going to make young people very, very angry in the future. This kind of thing. It's an anyway, interesting book, not great, but a, a good little twist book. Look like at the end, you kind of go, oh, okay. That was a good twist. So not bad. All right. Here's my promise to the audience. I don't know if you could tell, but I could tell. 
this uh, this is a bit of a struggle with a, with a one second, maybe two second delay. We're going to look into this. We're going to get to the bottom of this. Ben, do you have a handyman who can come and look at your internet? <laughs> you probably have three or four guys. Here's the thing. The, the greatest thing about this is it allow it did not allow you to jump in and talk over me. So maybe the audience will actually like it. I'm not a fan. All right. We'll, we'll try to get it better next week. Uh, send us an email, animalspiritspod at gmail.com. We'll talk to you then.